It is good to be back on a Wednesday night. Uh, we're going to pick up where we left off this past Sunday, and uh, we're looking at this great call uh, in Joshua, this call to this consecrated worshiping life. And you heard about that if you were here this past Sunday or listened to the message. And uh, the principle that we saw is that we have to have consecration before conquest. Now, there has to be worship before we enter the war. And all this is going somewhere because God is setting something up here. God is orchestrating something that we get to see tonight. And so, God continues to prepare His people in our text today for what's coming this Sunday and the walls of Jericho coming down. But here again, we see God go about His work in a very different way, very different than the way the world goes about their work. And our text opens up with God giving some interesting instructions to Joshua and then, of course, to the people. And one, the, one of the things we see here, it, we're reminded of, is that God's ways are not our ways. God's ways are not our ways. But the question is, can we hear Him? We know that there's a difference between God's ways and our ways. And we know that there is an element of mystery in God's providence in His ways, but yet also we see the psalmist and others asking God to teach me your ways, right? So God's ways are not our ways, but the question is, can we hear Him? So let's read our text. If you don't mind, if you are able, please stand. We're going to be in Joshua chapter 6. We'll read 14 verses, starting in verse 1. Now Jericho was shut up inside and outside because of the people of Israel. None went out and none came in. And the Lord said to Joshua, See, I have given Jericho into your hand with its king and the mighty men of valor. You shall march around the city, all the men of war going around the city once. Thus shall you do for six days. Seven priests shall bear seven trumpets of ram's horns before the ark. And on the seventh day you shall march around the city seven times, and the priests shall blow the trumpets. And when they make a long blast with the ram's horn, when you hear the sound of the trumpet, then all the people shall shout with a great shout, and the wall of the city will fall down flat, and the people shall go up, every one straight before him. So Joshua, son of Nun, called the priest and said to them, Take the ark of the covenant, and let seven priests bear seven trumpets of ram's horn before the ark of the Lord. And he said to the people, Go forth, march around the city, and let the armed men pass before the ark of the Lord. And just as Joshua had commanded the people, the seven priests bearing the seven trumpets of ram's horn before the Lord went forward, blowing the trumpets, with the ark of the covenant of the Lord following them. The armed men were walking before the priest who were blowing the trumpets, and the rear guard, was, rear guard was walking after the ark while the trumpets blew continually. But Joshua commanded the people, you shall not shout or make your voice heard. Neither shall any word go out of your mouth until the day I tell you to shout. Then you shall shout. So he calls the ark of the Lord to circle the city, going about it once. And they came into the camp and spent the night in the camp. Then Joshua rose early in the morning, and the priest took up the ark of the Lord. And the seven priests, bearing the seven trumpets of the ram's horn before the ark of the Lord, walked on. And they blew the trumpets continually. And the armed men were walking before them, and the rear guard was walking after the ark of the Lord, while the trumpets blew continually. And on the second day, they marched around the city once and returned to the camp. So they did for six days. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. You may be seated. Now, I want you to notice that this text opens up with Jericho being shut up, it says, the Bible says shut up, shut up inside and outside. Notice that, inside and outside. 
It was as if all the noise, if there was any, was closed up in the city. And this is when Joshua hears the Lord speak to him again. But the picture that's painted here is it seems like the fear of the Lord had produced a hush in Jericho. And God was about to blast the shofar, the ram's horn, so that he could be heard. God wants to be heard here. Remember verse 10, it says, you shall not shout, Joshua told the people, you shall not shout or make your voice heard. Don't say any word until I tell you to. So all of this is set up with fear causing Jericho to be quiet, but they're looking out, they're watching. But what is heard is God's ceremonial shofar that's used in worship. Interesting. I told you that God's ways are not our ways, and we understand that, but there are four particular things that are out of place in this story. Four particular things, and they're all found in one verse, and that is verse 4. So I'll put that back up on the screen. Joshua chapter 6, verse 4. See if you notice the four things that are out of place. Seven priests shall bear seven trumpets of ram's horns before the ark. There's three of them. On the seventh day, you shall march around the city seven times, and the priest shall blow the trumpets. There's the fourth. Four things out of place. Priest, ram's horns, ark, seventh day. Priest, ram's horns, ark, seventh day. First, you have the priest. The priests here are involved. But hasn't God, God already made it clear that the priests are not supposed to go off to war? They're not supposed to be a part of the battle. Hmm. Second, you have the ram's horn, the shofar. Well, whenever you're directing the armies, you don't use a shofar. You use a metal or silver trumpet. Hmm. Third, you have the ark. You don't take the ark into battle. What if it's captured? That happens a little later, by the way. The ark's not supposed to be out there. Lastly, it looks like they're going to march and be marching on the seventh day, which means they're going to be marching on the Sabbath. You don't do work on the Sabbath. So all of these actions, priest, ram's horn, ark, seventh day, for all these actions, there's either been precedent set or laws given by God that they are not to be done. So why is God now commanding them to do this? It looks as if he's sending them into battle, which I think we would categorize as work on the Sabbath. It looks like he's giving them mixed signals about things he's already made clear in Deuteronomy and Leviticus and other places. The thing is, is while it looks like God is sending them off into battle, they're not using the normal things they would in battle. Again, they're not using the silver trumpet. The ark is going out. They're doing this on the Sabbath and the priests are involved. And you say, what is going on here? Well, the truth is, is that they're not going into battle. That's not the point. It's not what they're doing. They're not going into a physical, earthly battle. Now, you know, they think they are. I'm sure the soldiers have been asking Joshua, Joshua, we got to like get prepared here. We need to get our lines together and our swords, uh, swords sharpened, right? But the truth is they're not, they're not actually going into a battle, not a physical battle. 
But they are going into a spiritual battle, a spiritual battle. Now, remember, God is going to fight for them. Their job, I said Sunday, is not to win the war. It's not their job. Their job is to worship and obey. Worship and obey. And what we see God doing here, I told you he's setting something up. God is setting up here a worshiping processional. He's not lining them up to fight like armies would fight. He's setting up a worshipful processional. You see, God wants us to trust his ways. I don't know if I told you or not, but God's ways are not our ways. Did I ever tell you that? God's ways, they're not our ways. And God wants us to trust his ways. And we talk a lot about trusting the will of God. We talk a lot about that. We talk a lot about trusting the will of God in our life, but if we're being honest, we like to come up with the ways that God's will gets worked out in our life, don't we? We say, yeah, I trust the will of God, but the way that gets played out in my everyday life, whether it be small decisions or big decisions, I would really like to make that call. But God's ways are not our ways. And sometimes we're asking questions about God's will when we should be asking questions about God's ways. God's ways. This is where we have to trust the ways of God because so many times they seem so counterintuitive. The ways of God can seem so counterintuitive. This is an army, and all of a sudden now they're setting up completely different than what they have before. They're going up against a unique battle because they've never fought against a fortified city. And how they're going to go about this is to take the ark of God representing his presence. They're going to take some worship uh, instruments called shofars, and they're going to walk around and blow the trumpets. Interesting. The fear of God has gripped the people of Jericho. And I'm sure on the first day that they did this, I'm sure the people of Jericho were wondering what is about to happen. Remember, they've already heard what's been going on, right? Remember that with Rahab? Their hearts have been melting. And I'm sure on the first day when Israel came out and they're all lined up and the ark is leading the way and all the soldiers are silent. All right, that's spooky. And then all they hear is this continual blast of a horn, and it starts, and everybody's watching. And they just make their way around. It's about nine acres, Jericho. Make their way all the way around, all the way back around. They come back to the starting point, and then what do they do? They go back to camp. Day one, I'm sure they're going, what in the world was that? But then on day two, they come back out. They line back up. The ark of the Lord is there. Everybody's quiet. They're just staring. Horns continually blasting. And they start walking. Again. And Jericho's just watching them. I'm not going to turn around again, just so you know. (laughs) But they're just watching them. Then they come back on a third day. And then a fourth day. And then a fifth day, and then a sixth day. Think about this. Six days of them coming out, lining up, Ark of the Covenant, silence, blasting the shofar, walk around the city, go home. Now, at some point, I'm sure the people of Jericho begin to wonder, can Israel do anything but walk around and toot a horn? I mean, at some point, this begins to look silly, right? And then on the seventh day, they come back out, and Jericho's thinking, here they go again. Oh, but this time. They don't walk around one time. They walk around seven times. 
I told you, God's ways are not our ways. If they're going into battle, I don't think it's a good idea to wear your army out by walking around a city seven times before you go into battle. Now, I was not in the military. This is common sense talking to me, okay? But this is what's taking place. And at some point, I'm sure the people of Jericho thought this is getting a little ridiculous. And again, it makes no human sense, but they were not fighting a human battle. This was a spiritual battle. And to fight our spiritual battles, God wants us to trust his ways. And listen, when a spiritual battle comes to us, and they come all the time, but when a spiritual battle comes to, a, comes to us, so many times when that happens for us, we start questioning God's will, don't we? Spiritual battle comes and we say, surely, Lord, I'm not supposed to be entangled in this. Surely this is not your will, Right? Or surely, Lord, I'm not supposed to deal with this issue. You know, why me, Lord? Whenever we find ourselves in a spiritual battle, we start questioning God's will. But maybe God is inviting us to do something different. When we engage in a spiritual battle, maybe God is not wanting us to question his will. Maybe he's inviting us to inquire about his ways. Again, we start questioning God's will so many times, but God may actually be inviting us to investigate and then execute His ways. When we're talking about God's will, we're talking about the what's, W-A-T, apostrophe S, W-A-T, W-H-A-T, sorry, W-H-A-T. We're talking about the what, right? What do you want me to do, God? What do you want me to be a part of, God? Right? That's normally, whenever we're trying to talk about God's will, figure out God's will, what do you want me to do? Where do you want me to go? That kind of thing. And then we're questioning why. What do you want me to do and why do you want me to do it? But when we're talking about God's ways, we're talking about the how. The how. Not so much what, whatever that may be, it's how do you want me to live in that and how do you want me to live through that? God's ways deal with the how. Because it gets at who am I in the midst of that spiritual battle that I find myself in. How we go about living as God's people here and now is just as important of a question as what we do. How do we do what we do? Again, that gets at God's ways, his ways in our life. In these days of marching around, God was instructing them, telling them how to go about being his people. How to go about being his people. How to go about winning, truly winning this particular battle. But again, many times we live our life questioning the why why am I in this situation or whatever it may be? But maybe God is inviting us to ask the question of how. How does God want me to live in or how does God want me to live through this particular situation? That is discovering God's ways. Now, you may say, why are God's ways, which are higher than our ways, why are they so important? Why are they so important? Well, clearly there's a mysterious element to them, yes. Yes. But if you look back at the priest being involved at Jericho, the shofar or the ram's horn being involved at Jericho or the ark of the covenant being involved in Jericho or even the marching around on the Sabbath, what you realize, again, is that these were not an act of war, but they were acts of worship. This was Israel following God's ways in front of the people of Jericho. At first, it looks silly, right? But they're obeying his voice in front of the people of Jericho. And why did God want them to have this worship processional around Jericho? Well, it's simple. God wants us to follow his ways, just like the people of that day, because he wants to make himself known. See, our obedience is not just for us. When we are obedient to the will and ways of God, that's when God 
is made known. Whenever we talk about God's will, many times it's something very personal for us. I do this or that or whatever. But how we live that out in God's ways, that's the testimony. That's what people see in so many ways. The processional around Jericho blowing the horn, the shofar that was used in worship, the processional around Jericho with the priest and the Ark of the Covenant, the processional around Jericho on the holy day were all actions that pointed to God. It's God's voice through the ram's horn that's being heard, not the voice of the people. It's God's priest who tend to the Ark of the Covenant and then mediate that with the people. It's God's day on the Sabbath that's set apart as holy so they walk around seven times, not just once. The whole processional pointed the people of Jericho to the reality of who God was or who God is. God did not need this ragtag group of Israelites to try to fight a battle. He needed them to follow his ways once he had revealed them to them so that he could be made known to the peoples who were watching. And sometimes God's ways do not make sense to us, and that's simply because we're not God, but he sees the bigger picture. Notice what they're doing. God is retelling the story. Do you see it? Second Passover they ever had. First Passover, Exodus 12, one year later, Numbers 9. Numbers 9, second Passover they ever had. They haven't had one until they got into the promised land, right? Because they ate manna for 40 years. What did they do? In Numbers 9, they, did, they um, had the Passover. Numbers 10, what did they do? Processed from Sinai to the wilderness. What did they just do here as God's people going into the promised land? Circumcision, little recovery, then... Passover. What happens the seven days after Passover? The feast of unleavened bread. So for the feast of unleavened bread, they are marching. God's just retelling his story. Notice how he has it all set up. Who leads? The ark leads. The presence of God. The priests mediate between the presence of God and the people. The horns are blasted continually, declaring the praises of this God who leads his people. He's just telling the story. He's wanting Jericho to see it. His way is that he wants Israel, Joshua, get the people to follow my command. I'm doing something bigger than you just walking around the city. I'm showing them who I am. And if you will obey and follow my ways, even though they may not make sense to you, I will be made known. The whole thing is a worship processional. Now, the people aren't supposed to talk. They're not going to draw their sword in that sense. Do you remember verse 1? Joshua 6 verse 1 says, Now Jericho was shut up inside and out because of, the text should say, the Lord, but it doesn't. Joshua 6 1 says, Now Jericho was shut up inside and out because of the people of Israel. Interesting. They're inside, locked up, because they fear, verse 1 says, the people of Israel. You see that? God's not going to let Israel win this battle. He's going to fight it for them. Because God does not want Israel to be feared. He wants to be feared and revered. So he didn't let them win the battle. He fights it for them. He flattens the wall. They just focus on going about doing what he said to do, going about what it is that he commanded them to do, the way he told them to do it, and then he wins the war. Now, time out right there. You may say, Chris, this is a great story, and I've enjoyed it for years or minutes. But 
How does this apply to a New Testament Christian? Thank you for asking. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. For consider your calling, brothers. Not many of us, not many of you were wise according to the worldly standards. Not many were powerful. Not many were noble of noble birth. But God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, even things that are not to bring to nothing things that are. Why did he do that? So that no human being might boast in the presence of God before the ark. And because of him, you are in Christ Jesus, who became to us wisdom from God, righteousness and sanctification and redemption. So that, as it is written, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. Why didn't God want Israel to get the credit for the victory? It seems that as this is building, they go from our hearts are melting because we hear what God has done to fearing the people, God's people, not God. So you get to Jericho And so something else is going on. Not only does Jericho's walls have to come down, but God is also managing his people. Why didn't God want Israel to get the credit for the victory? There's a problem with us humans. For humans, too much praise can produce pride. God doesn't want prideful people. He wants them to know he's the one that brings down the walls. Just like for us, New Testament, 1 Corinthians 1, God chose, God chose, God chose, so that we may not boast in his presence. Those of us who are in Christ, who've experienced righteousness, sanctification, redemption, you don't boast, you boast in the Lord. God didn't want Israel to get the credit for the victory because for humans, too much praise can produce pride. We're gonna see it play out as we go through this book. Pride is the white noise that blocks out God's voice. It is the ambient noise that blocks us, keeps us from hearing the voice of God. And when we don't hear the voice of God, we won't know the ways of God. Why didn't God want them to get credit for this victory? He didn't want them to be prideful. Because when you get prideful, it starts clouding your ability to hear Him so that you can continue to live out His ways. Are you with me there? Ken Jones wrote a book Actually, the title of his book is, When You're All Out of Noodles, Go Figure. He said one day he walked into his office and he noticed something that he had never seen before. Sitting on the ground, there was uh, something about the size of a dessert plate and it was plugged into the wall and it was giving out a constant noise. It wasn't loud, just constant. He finally asked the receptionist, what was that? And she says, it was an ambient noise generator creates white noise. You've probably seen one. She said, if it's too quiet in here, we can distinguish the voices in the counseling office and we want to protect their privacy. So we brought, we bought this noise generator generator to cover their voices. Now he said her explanation made perfect sense, but he said, didn't it have to be louder to cover up the conversation? And she said, oh no, the ambient noise machine does not have to be loud. But because of the constant noise, the sound tricks the ear so that what is being said cannot be distinguished. That's what white noise does. It doesn't have to be loud, but it tricks the ear so that what's being said out there cannot be distinguished. Ken Jones said this led him to pray this prayer. No wonder, Lord, no wonder I strain to hear what you have to say to me. The constant sound, little noises, soft, inward, ambient thoughts and fears and attitudes tricking the ears of my inner man and masking your still, small 
voice. God's ways are not our ways. The question is, I told you in the beginning, but can you hear him? Can you hear him? There comes these moments. I'm sure Joshua and the people are experiencing one right now. Where it does not seem to make sense. And those are the moments when we have to trust that God sees not just a bigger picture. He sees the whole picture. But our job is not just to follow his will, but his ways. How we go about living out his will. Because that's the testimony. God wants to be heard. He wants to be seen. He wants to be known. And he has a people who if we will follow his ways, that will happen. It may not make sense to us right now when we're walking around. But the big picture that God is right, the big story that God is writing, they will see him and he'll get the glory. Amen. Amen. Father, I thank you that you invite us to be a part of this story that you are writing from beginning to end, from Adam to your return to a new heavens and a new earth. And Lord, we play a small part in this. But Lord, I pray that the part we play, you would just help us trust your ways. Trust your ways. It may not make sense. It may not seem natural. But Lord, help us trust that our lives as your people here now would be a worshiping processional so that other people may see you and know you. Lord, that's all we want. We want your glory on display through us. So Lord, we don't walk with blind faith. No, we walk with trusting faith. Trusting that you are writing a bigger story. May you help us be a part of it. Lord, we love you. We thank you for loving us. In Jesus' good name, amen.